in a case they lost in 2011 for federal recognition. You can support their work through their website. And I encourage you to also look at the Native American Cultural Center website here at Stanford, nacc.stanford.edu, if you want to learn more about how to improve the life of American Indians in our immediate community. Uh, before I introduce our guest, Elizabeth Sechmeister from Vanderbilt University, let me mention a couple of housekeeping issues. Today's lecture will be a Zoom seminar, uh, Zoom webinar. So all attendees are in listen only mode and only the speakers will be able to share the video. If you run into any technical problems or have a question, please reach out using the Zoom chat. The lecture portion of this webinar, the first 40, 45 minutes will be recorded and live streamed on our class YouTube page. And those of you who wish to participate in the Q&A should be on the webinar uh, Zoom, uh, you will automatically appear uh, 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 with that possibility of asking Q&A uh, as, as those will not be live streamed, but you will be able to ask them in the Zoom. All webinar attendees will be muted throughout the webinar, but you can send questions through the Q&A button. Um, and I will be reading those questions to Professor Sechmeister at the end of her presentation. So thanks again to Professor Sechmeister and thanks also to CDDRL for co-sponsoring this event. Uh, Professor Elizabeth Liz Sechmeister is a Cornelius Vanderbilt Professor of Political Science and she's also the director of LAPOP Lab at Vanderbilt University. Her research focuses on comparative political behavior and public opinion with a particular focus in Latin America. Her work has uh, involved studies of voting, ideology, political parties, representation, charisma, and crisis. Sechmeister has studied public opinion consequences of terrorist threats and natural disasters. Uh, she has, for example, a book called Democracy at Risk, how terrorism, terrorist threats affect the public, uh, and also a book on Latin American party systems. She's also the co-editor of the Latin American Voter, Michigan Press 2015. In her role as LAPOP director, she leads an incredible effort of the America's Barometer, the I would say the most important, the most rigorous, rigorous, regular regional survey of democracy and public opinion in 34 countries, including uh, the, the whole hemisphere. Uh, she is currently also the chair of the Comparative Study of Electoral Systems Project, uh, and she has received numerous awards beyond also a, a very large number of publications. Uh, Liz, it's really a pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you so much, Alberto. Thank you for that, that kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm gonna to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So I'm gonna to talk today about support for democracy. And what I wanna do, what I wanna accomplish with this talk is to give you a sense of the empirical landscape with respect to support for democracy in the Americas. And then I'm also gonna make some arguments about the dynamics surrounding support for democracy in the Americas and, and beyond. What I'm gonna do effectively is deliver some bad news on the health of democracy and public opinion within the Latin American and Caribbean region. I'm gonna make some arguments about causes and ultimately though not completely uh, address the question of possible remedies by focusing on the role of elections. If there are clarifying questions that um, you have during the talk, you can pop them into the Q&A. And Alberto, please feel free to interrupt me if there's a, a clarifying question that would help um, move us along more effectively. So I'm gonna start at the 10,000 foot level with this quote. When political scientists view the variety and instability of political systems in the modern world, they can hardly believe with conviction in democracy in the foreseeable future. This is a statement that easily could have been made today, but it was made in 1963 by a preeminent scholar of public opinion and democracy, Gabriel Almond. It not only resonated in the 1960s as it resonates for many of us today, but it easily could have been made at any other time in the last 200 or so years. Why? because democracy is fragile. As a fragile system, democracy's hold increases and it decreases over time and across countries. These days, globally, we are in a period of recession. The Freedom House Organization, which tracks global trends in democracy, noted that 2019 
was the 14th consecutive year of decline in global freedom. This graph that you see on the slide is from their latest report where they show that since 2006, each year around the world, more countries have experienced democratic erosion or loss than have experienced gains. The Americas have not been immune to this recession. On the left side of this slide, you see a comparative static map that was created by VDEM, another institute that monitors levels of democracy. Here for 2019, darker blue signals higher quality democracy and lighter blue signals lower quality democracy. If you compare the various shades of blue across the region to the dark blue benchmark set by Canada at the top of the map, you see that many countries in the region are deficient to some degree on this measure of democracy. And on the right side, you see graphs showing trends in the Latin American and Caribbean region toward democracy and away from democracy over time. The crossing of the red line above the blue line in recent years documents a democracy recession for the LAC region. This raises the question, what's causing this pattern of erosion? And today I'm gonna to put a spotlight on one culprit, which is declining public commitment to democracy. In doing so, I'm going to, to first lean on research published recently by Chris Clausen, who wrangled together a tremendous amount of data to show that support for democracy is an important input into democratic consolidation and stability. You can see this relationship graph in the figure that I've inserted here from his article. The graph shows the predicted increase in the level, in level of democracy that's anticipated by his model following an increase in support for democracy at the point marked zero on the x-axis. Conversely then, waning public support is detrimental to democracy. So if increasing public support for democracy increases the level of democracy, then conversely, waning public support decreases, leads to declines in the level of democracy. Or as Clausen puts it, if support is low, emerging democracies might fail to consolidate or even descend into autocracy. But this then raises another question, which is, is support for democracy declining in the Latin American and Caribbean region? And as I've already given away in the title to this talk, the answer is yes. And that's where the core of this talk is centered. So I'm gonna pause here and outline the rest of the talk. As you can see from the slide here, the talk is divided into four main parts. First, I'll document a declining commitment to democracy in the LAC region. Second and third, I'll discuss a set of factors that I'll argue are contributing to that decline. And fourth, I'll make the argument that elections are one mechanism by which public commitment to democracy can be renewed. The data that I'm drawing on today come from three sources. First, to understand the dynamics around support for democracy in the LAC region, I'm going to make use of LAPOP's America's Barometer surveys and as well, two additional surveys that we conducted this summer in the LAPOP lab. I wanted to note that these surveys, the America's Barometer and the 2020 surveys are supported by USAID, Vanderbilt and the Consortium of Partners and Advisors across the region. The America's Barometer data are freely available on our website. I hope that many of you uh, consider making use of, of the data. The third data set that I'm gonna draw on today is a global democratic attitudes database that I've pulled together along with my co-author, Oscar Casadena. We are working on a project that's in progress that I'm gonna show you a little bit of at the end today. And this data set pulls together as many regional uh, comparative surveys as we could get our hands on. And that number totals about 1,900 when we look at satisfaction with democracy and about just under 700 when we look at support for democracy. Okay, so part one, let's begin with documenting decline in support for democracy in the Americas. 
What you see here is a scorecard for public opinion in terms of mass support for democracy and satisfaction with democracy for the LAC region. The colors and the values summarize change in these opinions over time between 2016 and 2019. Green is a gain, red is a loss, darker colors represent more substantial shifts, and the numbers are arbitrary, assigned one, two, or three, just to um, give us some ability to take into consideration the magnitude of the change. The scorecard includes all countries in the Latin American and Caribbean region that were surveyed as part of the last round of the Americas barometer. They're counting countries there at home. You'll see that Venezuela is not present. It's because Venezuela had um, transitioned to a situation in which it was no longer possible to safely conduct interviews in the 2018-19 round. And I can talk about that in the Q&A period if anyone is interested. What you can see when you look at the scorecard is that there are more losses than gains in these attitudes for the region between these years. There's variation across countries, but the sea of red is bad news when it comes to taking the, the sort of the health of the, you know, take a summary of the health of the uh, public opinion toward democracy in the region. And I want you to note, because we'll come back to them later, some of the countries that are doing better in these, uh, on this graph, on this chart, uh, than others. So Brazil, Mexico, in some sense, Chile, Paraguay, Colombia, are countries where we saw some uptick in support for democracy and or satisfaction with democracy. And in the other countries, we either saw no change or declines. Okay, the Americas barometer, what, what I do now is I'm gonna turn to show you some data that underlie this, this summary assessment. So as I promise, I'll give you an empirical look at what public opinion in the Americas looks like. The Americas barometer asks about support for democracy by asking individuals to indicate the extent to which they agree or disagree with this statement. It's a statement that's inspired by something that Winston Churchill said. And the statement we give people is this, democracy may have problems, but it is better than any other form of government. So if you're playing along at home, feel free to consider your own answer to this question. What I'm going to do is code anyone who lands on the agree side of the scale as supportive of democracy. So then we can look at the proportion of people who fall on that side of the scale, that is the proportion of people who support democracy. What this next graph shows you is the proportion of people in the LAC region for each round of the America's barometer who are supportive of democracy. And what you can see is the decline in support in, for democracy in recent years. Specifically, you can see that there was a significant drop of about 10 percentage points between 2014 and the more recent rounds of the America's Barometer survey. Just to make sure that everyone is clear on how to read this type of graph, since I'll be showing a number of them, the dot that you see above the, uh, below the number is the mean estimate from the survey data. The gray bar is the confidence interval around that estimate. And when I show regional means, I'm calculating these by first aggregating data to the country level and then taking the average of those country means as opposed to weighting the data by the population in each country. Also in these graphs, you can typically find the question wording and coding in the lower uh, left-hand corner. Okay, but you're probably curious what things look like across countries in terms of support for democracy. So the next slide shows you a comparative chart. Again, showing you the proportion of people in this case in each country who are supportive of democracy using the last round of the America's barometer. You can see Uruguay at the top with about 76% of adults reporting that they support democracy and Honduras at the bottom with 45% expressing support for democracy. It's worth noting that there are four countries where we estimate fewer than one in two adults supports democracy, Peru, Bolivia, Guatemala, and Honduras. And as a side note, written in text on the graph, and we can return to it later in the Q&A, it's worth noting that the young are less supportive of democracy on average in the region. Turning to satisfaction with democracy, 
we again see a significant drop in recent years, a new plateau forming in the 2016 to 2019 period. Mean levels of satisfaction with democracy are lower than mean levels of support for democracy. And if you look across countries, you can see that in only a handful of countries is the majority satisfied with how democracy is working. So here you see Canada, Uruguay, and the United States at the top of the graph, Colombia, Peru, and Panama at the bottom. So that's the portrait that we have with respect to support for democracy in the region over time and across countries. And I'm now going to move to considering a set of performance outcomes that I believe are contributing to a growing deficit in this, um, this growing deficit in confidence in democracy. And I'm gonna go on a, a little bit of a tangent here to insert some theory, which is that performance shapes commitments, commitments to democracy. A number of scholars have asserted this performance-based thesis. So I've given you a, a site here to work by Pedro Magalhães, who has some, some nice uh, work on this uh, topic, both in terms of a discussion of it and an illustration of this dynamic. And to be clear, the argument here is that when democracies fail to perform well, the public observes those failings and in turn decreases their confidence in democracy. In a nutshell, across a variety of indicators, democracy has not been performing well in the Latin American and Caribbean region. We can see this through one lens by taking some headlines from the news in recent years. Here's a story on one of Brazil's former presidents being sentenced to prison for corruption. Here's a headline on Mexico's struggle to tamp down on crime and violence. Here's a story on political tensions and confrontations in Nicaragua. Here's a headline on hyperinflation in Venezuela. And we could go on and on, but let's turn to what the public is reporting. What you see here is another scorecard. So this scorecard is focused on public evaluations and experiences with crime and insecurity, corruption, and economic well-being. Again, I'm summarizing change over time for the recent period. And what you can see is that the public is observing and reporting on widespread failings in the provision of the rule of law and, and with respect to economic security. So I've ordered the countries again this time where countries that are doing better are at the, at the sort of start of the chart and countries that are doing uh, particularly poorly in this time period are at the end of the chart. And again, as with democratic attitudes, you see more losses than gains. So I'm gonna give you a, a sense of what these indicators look like when we track them across time for a longer period for the region as a whole. And if you're interested in data across time, or for the 2018-19 round for a particular country, you can find those, those data on our, our website. So first, with respect to crime victimization, looking at the average for the region, we see an increase between the years 2014 and 2016. And that higher level of victimization experience then persisted into the most recent round. So these days, across the Latin American region, on average, about one in four adults are the victim of at least one crime in any given year. We also ask about perceptions of insecurity in our survey. The question that we use is on the right side of the slide here. And this graph then shows the proportion expressing that it is very unsafe in their neighborhood over time for the region since 2004. As the graph shows, there's been a notable increase in insecurity since 2012. The America's Barometer also tracks corruption victimization, measured by asking people about their experiences with bribe solicitation. So in other words, asking people if they've been asked to pay a bribe in one or more situations in the year prior to the survey. And we're gonna combine all those into a single measure, indicating whether or not the person was asked for one bribe or more than one bribe, uh, any, any bribe in the year prior to the survey or none. And so what you can see here 
in this cross time graph for the region is that bribe solicitation persists at a fairly elevated level. So we're getting close to one in five adults victimized by a corruption experience in any given year uh, prior to uh, our survey. We also see that bribe solicitation on average for the region is a pretty sticky phenomenon. It, it moves a little bit up and down, but it doesn't move by, by much over time. In recent years in the Americans Barometer Survey, we've asked about perceptions of corruption among politicians. And you can see here the results presented as the proportion of people who express that more than half or all politicians are corrupt. In 2016-17, that was about 64%, and in 2018-19, it was about 68%. So a slight increase to an already elevated number. Finally, we can look at the economic situation that people report. And we see here that there are reports of worsening economic situations, and those reports have increased on average for the region in recent years. So higher numbers here are, are worse to see because they mean that a greater number of people in the population are reporting that their own personal economic situation has decreased. And if we were to look at a similar figure for their perceptions of the national economic situation, we would see a similar pattern. So perceptions of both one's own economic situation and the national situation have been getting worse over time. And consistent with arguments made by others, the data suggests that this matters for democratic attitudes. So the table here is meant to just provide some uh, evidence of that. It summarizes results from two sets of regression analyses in which I predict each democratic attitude noted at the top of the column with the six performance indicators and some controls. And what you can see is that in each case, most or all of the theorized causes predict opinions on democracy. Lower evaluations and worse experiences are associated with lower support for democracy and lower satisfaction with democracy. In short, the crisis of confidence that the LAC region is ex experiencing with respect to democracy is rooted in systematic and persistent failures by a set of systems that are branded as democracies. I want to now turn to a brief look at the challenge that the pandemic poses for support for democracy in the region. And I'm going to do so through the lens of two surveys that we conducted this summer, one in Haiti and one in Peru. These are phone surveys as face-to-face -face research is not possible or practical right now for obvious reasons. The data are weighted to approximate a nationally representative sample. So first, let me note what many of you are no doubt already aware of, which is that the pandemic has been devastating to the Latin American and Caribbean region. The graph on the left is from the WHO, the World Health Organization, and gives an overview of the spread of cases across the region. The graph on the right is from Johns Hopkins and shows that out of the top 10 countries with the most reported cases around the world as of this month, five are in Latin America. So not surprisingly, when we ask people about the pandemic, the public tells us that they're, that they're concerned. We asked people in both Haiti and in Peru if they believe that the coronavirus outbreak is a very serious problem. And the majority in both countries think that it is. That is indicated by the darker blue slice that you see in each pie here. I want to note that you'll see that concern is higher on this measure in Peru. So you can see that in Peru, uh, about 77% of people say that the pandemic is very serious. And in Haiti, that number is 64%. That is most likely due to the timing of the two surveys. We conducted the Haiti survey when the pandemic was just beginning to hit the country. And we conducted the Peru survey a little bit later. If you've seen headlines coming out of Peru, you, uh, you know that accessing healthcare to treat the virus is a significant challenge. And the, rep the public reports this back to us with 
78% very worried about being able to access adequate health care if they fall ill due to the virus. Though not shown here, we also find a large majority are concerned about the state of healthcare in Haiti. Well, what about the implications of this pandemic for commitment to democracy? On the one hand, given the dynamics that I discussed already, we can anticipate that to the degree that the pandemic further erodes the rule of law and further erodes the economy in the region, support for democracy may continue to decline. On the other hand, I wanna assert that the pandemic may also have direct implications for commitment to democracy to the degree that it loosens public commitment to holding regular elections. So we were able to get a glimpse of this in the surveys that we conducted in Peru and Haiti by asking people about a scenario in which there is a public health emergency like the coronavirus. We asked people if in that kind of situation, it's all, too real at the moment of the survey, it was reasonable or justifiable for the president of the country to postpone elections. And you can see that 84% of people in Haiti reported, yes, it's, it's justifiable to postpone elections in this situation, and 65% of people in, in Peru. Well, what do those numbers mean? To put them in comparative perspective within these surveys, we randomly assigned half the respondents to this set of questions, and we randomly assigned another half of respondents to a, a similar question, but that question asked about postponing elections due to violence and um, sort of instability in, in the country. So, so sort of street instability, violence and violent confrontations. And what we see is that in both countries, the vast majority think postponing elections is reasonable in those cases, but not to the same degree that they express a willingness to tolerate postponing elections in the case of, of, of a pandemic like the current one. So I would argue that one of the many hazards that the pandemic is causing for democracy lies in the manner in which it increases the public's tolerance for postponing elections. And that's a problem because elections are integral to democracy. And this is where I'm gonna move on to the, the fourth part of this talk. Even the most minimal definitions of democracy require regular elections. So postponing elections is a problem because it postpones the most vital process that takes place within a democracy. It's also a problem because elections serve as a ritual by which the public regularly renews its commitment to a democracy. At least that's the argument I'm going to make in this last section. I'm gonna to begin to unpack that argument by first putting a spotlight on Brazil with data from the last America's Barometer survey. Here, you can see the proportion of Brazilians over time, according to the America's Barometer survey, that support democracy on the left and the proportion that are satisfied with democracy on the right. So these are the same two indicators that we've looked at previously. You can see a downward trend in both indicators in recent years from about 2010 or 2012 forward rates of support for democracy, rates of satisfaction with democracy decline. By 2017 in the survey, only a slim majority expressed support for democracy and nearly 80% were not satisfied with how democracy was working. And for understandable reasons, what democracy was delivering was not good. It was delivering poor economic performance, was delivering accusations that the president who was subsequently impeached was cooking the financial books. And people were observing those failings and updating their support for democracy, their commitment to democracy, and it's reflected in the survey. What happened next is important. In 2018, Jair Bolsonaro was elected to the presidency. In the most charitable of descriptions, you could say that Bolsonaro is ambivalent to democracy. And here you can see that ambivalence or 
arguably outright hostility to democracy in his own words. In 1993, he expressed support for dictatorship. In 1999, he expressed disdain for voting. In 2018, as a candidate, he made an offhand remark about shooting all of those who support a rival party, the PT, in the area in which he was campaigning at the time. And also in 2018, as a candidate, and again referring to those on the opposite side of the political aisle, he spoke of banishing his rivals from Brazil. And from just a sample of headlines, we can see that the actions that Bolsonaro has taken since his inauguration on January 1st, 2019, have continued to fuel concerns about his commitment to democracy and the implications of that weak commitment to democracy for Brazil's system. Moreover, you can see in the graph on the right side of the slide that Brazil's level of democracy has continued to erode since Bolsonaro's election. This is according to experts informing the VDEM project. You can see at the bottom a number of different, um, the, the legend that shows the number of different dimensions on which the uh, country is being evaluated over time. And as the note says there, the vertical line indicates the year before free and fair, before the free and fair elections indicator drops. Interestingly, that then stayed constant into 2019. There is a, actually a, an increase in a positive way in media bias in that measure, but the other measures, the other three measures uh, continue to fall into the, the time period in which Bolsonaro is, is, uh, has taken the presidency. So the question is, what has happened to public opinion uh, in, the, in the aftermath of Bolsonaro's victory? On the one hand, we might expect further decline in support for democracy and satisfaction with democracy. After all, the public was discontent with democracy and they, they elected an individual with visible autocratic leanings. But that's not what happened. Rather, what we see is a rebound in democratic attitudes following the election. So the election took place toward the end of 2018, in the, toward the beginning of around the, the, well, in January 1st, Bolsonaro inaugurated. In the first period of the year, we conducted the 2019 Brazil survey. And if you look at that last bar in each of those two charts, you see that there's been a rebound in support for democracy and in satisfaction with democracy. So then the question is, well, what, what's responsible for that rebound? Um, so let's dig into that. There's the rebound highlighted in the circles. The question is what's responsible? Some recent research by Chris Clausen points to one possibility. He argues that demand for democracy increases when democracy declines. So it's that very decline that begins to motivate citizens to, to take a fresh look at, the, at their preferences over systems and increase in their demand for democracy. In a preliminary set of uh, analyses on this topic that I've been working through with Oscar Casarina, we offer a second possibility, which is not a rival. So both of these hypotheses um, are, could exist in, in, you know, jointly with one another. That is to say, our argument may complement this first hypothesis. And that is that the holding of elections on average renews public commitment to democracy. So let me show you a, a test of this with the America's barometer data, looking at the LAC region, and then I'm gonna pull out and look at the global level. So here's a test with the most recent rounds of the America's barometer survey. Again, the expectation, well, not again, but let me say that the expectation is that surveys conducted soon after elections will report higher levels of commitment to democracy. That is, we're trying to look at the extent to which changes in democratic attitudes are conditional on how recent the last election was to the survey that was fielded. On the x-axis here, you have a number of months that had passed between the most recent national election and our America's Barometer survey. And on the y-axis, you see the, the change in support for democracy that we observed between the survey that was conducted uh, between the, the most recent one and the, and the prior survey. 
there's change in support for democracy between the 2016-17 round of the America's Barometer and the 2018-19 round. The Oval bands together the countries that had elections in close proximity to the last round of the America's Barometer survey. So you can see Brazil here, but if you recall, the countries that I had flagged for you at the very start of the talk as the countries in which we had seen some positive upticks in support for democracy, they're here on this side of the, the graph. So we see also here Mexico and Colombia, Paraguay, Chile, and Costa Rica, all of which had elections in about in a period that was about sort of within the 10 month plus period uh, prior to when we conducted the survey. So they're in a post-election period. Honduras stands out as an exception. There, there was an election in recent proximity to the, the timing of the survey, uh, just, just over 10 months prior, but it was a seriously flawed election and that may account for why it stands there as an outlier. So let's look at support for, or this is support for democracy. Let's look at satisfaction with democracy. Again, opinion, ticks upward in countries that have more recently experienced an election. In short, there seems to be something about going through the ritual of an election that on average acts to at least temporarily increase or restore confidence and satisfaction in democracy. We wanted though to put this to a more rigorous test. So we pulled together survey data from the 1970s to the, to the current period from all the available survey projects that we could find, all the comparative survey projects, all the regional barometers. And in total, we have about um, just under 700 that ask about support for democracy and about 1900 that ask about satisfaction with democracy. And this is what the, some of the data look like when we consider support for democracy. And let me explain this, this graph. The graph is showing a line that documents the mean level of support for democracy in the database, with the surveys sorted according to whether or not they were fielded soon after an election or soon or or, or, or not or before. So to wrangle the data into a readable figure, what we're doing here is we're looking at those surveys that took place up to 10 months prior to an election and up to 10 months after an election. That is, to read this, consider the zero line, the month of the election, and those surveys that are to the left are those that took place prior to an election, while those to the right are those that took place after an election. So if, a, if experience in an election increases support for democracy, we should see an uptick in that batch of surveys on average. And in fact, that's what we see. On average, there's higher support for democracy in that group at that point. So we see a bump in support for democracy that's conditional on the time of the survey relative to the last national election. Support for democracy is at least a, a bit higher in countries that have more recently experienced an election. So what about satisfaction with democracy? Here we find an even larger effect, which is not surprising given that Satisfaction with democracy is a question that's more specific and it's more elastic in terms of, uh, of if it's a nature of it as an attitude. We, um, so here at the point where we move from the survey taking place before or after an election, we see a jump in satisfaction with democracy. Mean levels of satisfaction are higher in surveys that take place after an election. And just as a note, um, we've run some analyses that look at variation by those who voted for the winning candidate and those who voted for the losing candidate. In this set of analyses that I'm referring to, we actually go back to the America's Barometer data. And interestingly, especially in light of some, uh, some research that suggests that election losers sometimes react differently to elections, we find the same dynamic for both supporters of winning candidates and supporters of losing candidates on average. On average, they have different levels of commitment to democracy and satisfaction with democracy. But on average, the dynamic by which experience in an election boosts support for democracy and satisfaction with democracy is found among both those supporting winners and those supporting losers. The group that's not affected so much is the set of non-voters. And that to us provides some additional support for our argument that participating 
in this quintessential democratic ritual restores faith in democracy. So I'm gonna end here with uh, just a quick summary of the key theoretical points and a few points on the empirics. The first is that democracy exists in a fragile state. Its survival rests on a number of factors, including public commitment to the system. Public support for democracy and democracy are eroding in tandem in the Americas. Persistent public per, or per, persistent poor performance undermines support for democracy in theory, and also appears to be a key factor in declining support for democracy in the LAC region. In bad times, when the public has waned in its support for democracy, elections carry the potential to feel erosion by electing in leaders with thin commitment to democracy. But these same elections carry the potential to bolster support for democracy. Clawson argues that this happens as the public responds to democratic decay, while we argue that there's also a direct effect of elections on support for democracy. Elections are the most important and sacred of democratic rituals and experiencing them on average gives a boost to public faith in democracy. That post-election rebound in commitment to democracy is important because it may increase motivations to confront and reverse democratic decline. But that post-election bump appears to be temporary, which may mean that there is a window in the post-election time period during which democracy promotion and democracy building efforts are especially critical to the long-term survival of democracy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. Uh, I don't know if we can maybe stop sharing your screen so that, uh, okay, yes, so we, we are able to, to, to see you. Uh, you've packed an enormous amount into your